It's really nice to be here. And I've got to say, whenever I come to this venue, I always say, I really want to find out who the architect was who built this place so we can ensure he has nothing to do with the rebuild of Christchurch. <laughs> Is that too harsh? I mean, it's kind of, I think it's great we've still got facilities like this left, but honestly, yeah, I mean, what a place, eh? Hey? Um, Uh, maybe, maybe I'm probably going to be told off now for being less of a sort of a public service CEO, but never mind. Um, I thought I'd talk a bit about the Orion experience and um, what our lessons were, and then I thought I'd talk a bit about sort of how I see some of those lessons playing on to um, the rebuild, of, the rebuild of the, ro of the wider city. I know there's a bit of a, um, a tour on tomorrow to Orion, so um, hopefully what I say today isn't contradicted by what my what my former colleagues at Orion tell you tomorrow. So like Orion is a local transport, electricity transport company. Um, you know, assets of about a billion dollars, employees, about 150 people. So, you know, it's a reasonably, reasonably sized business. Um, it's one of those businesses which has been relatively stable. So the management of the board have actually been focused on running the business rather than going off and the shenanigans you get when you go and sell a business or buy another business. They were very focused on what the core business was. So they're also focused, they weren't focused on, they were focused on the business and the core business. They weren't focused on building a wind farm somewhere or running a finance company or doing a whole lot of other things. You actually see a whole lot of equivalent businesses to mine doing. Um, it was also a business that was actually very focused here on what its risks were. And I don't know, if, I don't think Peter really explicitly said it, but we at Orion always recognised our biggest risk was always the earthquake risk. There was, no, there was no other thing that was going to give us you know, a bigger headache than a big quake. We weren't sure what it was going to be. We kind of planned for the Alpine Fault, and we always called the Alpine Fault being something between a 1 in 50 and a 1 in 100 year event. So we're very conscious that that was our biggest risk, and we thought carefully in sort of every aspect of the business about how we'd manage such an event. So from the physical asset stuff, it was about tying down things that were going to fall over. So big 20, 30, 50 tonne transformers, bolting them down onto really solid bits of concrete so they weren't going to go anywhere. Making sure the bits of concrete they were sitting on weren't going to drop too much when we had liquefaction because we understood liquefaction was going to be a real issue. And um, Peter talked about what the engineers forecast would happen at the port. And Orion, we also forecast about how much our bigger substations maybe drop into the ground in places like Bexley. And once again, they actually forecast it very, very accurately. So it was about those fundamental backup assets, but it was also about small things as well. It was about things like what sort of cell phones we used. Were they cell phones where you could take the battery or batteries off and charge them when you ran out of charge, because it's a pain in the ass when the power's off, or when you ran out of cell phone charge, walking around trying to talk on your cell phone while you're still plugged into the wall. It was about um, the sort of vehicles we had, and, right, you know, having four-wheel drive vehicles, it was all those sort of things as well. So it was big stuff and small stuff. It was also about, if you go to a substation, there are batteries there that keep all the computer systems going to make sure that the, all the gear gets protected. So all these protection systems run on little computers and they will need batteries, so when the power goes off they keep going. Tying the batteries down with 10 cent, battery, with 10 cent cable ties so they didn't fall off the wall because if those batteries fell off, the computer systems didn't work and the computer systems didn't work, nothing worked. So it was about big stuff and little stuff. So then we had that event in September and we thought, man, we've been through something. We thought, man, that was an enormous event. We thought, we're never going to have anything like this again. Well, initially, that's what we thought anyway. Um, none of our big assets got damaged. Um, the assets that, employ, that supply 10 or 20,000 customers, the big freeways, if you like, none of them suffered any serious damage because of all that work we'd done. Um, by the end of that night, on the first day, we had 90% of the power back on. And by the end of the week, everything was back on. But we had all the real damage was just cable damage. All that work we'd done to strengthen buildings, tie down transformers, all that worked. The underground cables had issues because of the amount of ground movement we had. Out in the rural area where the event was, was centred, some of the lines got pulled off overhead poles, but pretty much it wasn't actually too bad. But overall it was three or four times bigger than any event we'd ever managed before compared to, say, a big, a big snow event. Um, but we thought we'd been through a lot. We made a little documentary. Um, I think, Jared, I don't know if you helped with us, Jared. Did you help us with that, Jared? Yeah, I did. Um, you chose <laughs> but for the next round, we did choose Jared to help us with it. With the next, with the, he'd helped us with the film for the next little documentary we made. 
But anyway, but we thought, we, you know, we paid everybody a bonus. But we also sat back very carefully and thought about the lessons we learned. And we also went off to GNS and asked them what they thought the chances were of having another event. And apparently we were one of the only players who went off and asked GNS what the chances were of another event. And in fact, I was due to have a board meeting on February the 23rd. And in my board papers it said, you know, probabilities of another event have dropped. But it's still around about a 20% chance we're going to have something significant. Um, so then we had February, and I thought, wow, you know, I went out into Manchester Street, and um, for a start I sort of kicked myself and said, is this actually really happened? Because, you know, there were buildings down around us, um, I could talk for hours about leadership, but I've never had that intensity of everybody looking at me saying, what do we do now? Um, we went back around the back of the building, and the phones were initially out, so I said, bring me the satellite phone. We brought a satellite phone after, after September, and they said, yeah, it's in the shop, Roger, being fixed. <laughs> so <laughs> that key moment, you've always, I've always wanted to say, bring me the satellite phone, but anyway. <laughs> um, and, you know, the next week was dominated by just trying to work out what had happened. It was largely just all these underground cables, all the seismic work we'd done worked, but the land movement had just, you know, broken, you know, literally hundreds of, of underground cables. We had about 1,000 underground cables to be fixed. We had enough... We had the same number of underground cables to be fixed to get the power back on that we'd normally fix in a decade. Um, we built some big overhead lines, and we built them pretty quickly. We got them consented pretty quickly. Normally the consent process to build big overhead lines to replace those underground cables would take years if you'd get consent at all. Um, in this case, we drew some big, we got some big A0 aerial photographs of Christchurch. I got a big felt pen and drew these line routes on there. We figured a felt pen was better than a biro because a felt pen gave you a, lo a, a fatter line, so uh, it gave us more freedom about where we could actually build these lines. <laughs> but it was kind of interesting. You know, we, got, we, we took these, these, these A0 drawings or photographs down to the Civil Defence Headquarters to get them signed by the Civil Defence Controller because he could sign them off. And he signed them, and then I remember the minister's um, sort of minder saying, date it as well. Um, <laughs> But I took those drawings back to, back to work, saying we could get on with building these overhead lines, and guys were really excited. It was kind of amazing. Even in an event like this, people actually had a, some doubt about whether we'd be allowed to go out and do some of these, do some of these pretty radical things. Um, I remember on that first day, we've got a, we had a backup control room, sort of a, a concrete and steel bunker. And you know, we went to get in the door, and there's, there's a normal lock in case the electronics fail. And there was also the electronic, you know, use your swipe card on. And um, I said, well, who's got the key? Because I was thinking we only had a key. And I thought, no one had a key. I said, well, someone go on to Armour Street and grab the first fire engine we can find. The big steel door. And um, let's just get some gas axe and buddy, break the door down. Because, you know, normally if you use the backup control, I'm always, you always go in there calmly and go and use it. But then so I said, Roger, you can just use your swipe card. <laughs> but, you know. But that was the thing about those sort of drills. Often you have a drill, but the drill doesn't also involve just opening the door and, and getting into the room. Um, you know, we worked like demons for a month. Um, we brought a lot of external people on. Um, there was quite a lot of resistance to bringing external people in. People thought we should just be able to do it ourselves. People felt threatened by bringing external people in. Um, it was hard as leaders sometimes persuading people that this is actually something else. We brought other people and they'd actually do it as well as we were going to do it. Um, some of the lessons, you know, I start off always, well, the lessons for an event like this is governance. Governance of organisations matters a lot. Who the board is, how they behave, what priorities they set, the tone of the organisation. Governance matters. And I think that's a real issue for local government, that I'm not sure local government always has strong governance around key assets. And I think governance is incredibly important. Um, the governance of our assets also meant that I think my owners were able to take gutsier decisions about spending money to make them stronger than perhaps local body politicians would have taken. I think in general local body politicians and politicians in general think relatively short term. In my case, my commercial directors were willing to take longer term decisions that cost money, that force prices up. Um, I think there are real lessons around governance. Um, We kept the board away for the first couple of weeks. You know, the board kind of wanted to be there. Um, but I figured actually the board coming in and asking questions actually wasn't going to help us. It was just going to distract us. And them asking well-intentioned questions that were going to actually upset some really tired people wasn't actually going to help. So, 
keeping the board away while they had a roll, um, I thought was um, worked for us. Um, people, um, we had a strong culture at Orion, we knew it mattered, we had this expression mocked, major outage causing huge economic disruption. We said we don't like being mocked, we'll never let ourselves be mocked. Um, we, had old, we had people there that I think sort of a new age organisation would have got rid of because of sort of, you know, they had old knowledge, but that old knowledge, I think a lot of organisations would have thought didn't actually count, but I think the old knowledge, a lot of our people actually really came to play on the day. Old people who had old relationships around the city made a real difference. Um, youth was important, but some of that old knowledge, that old know-how really, really counted. Um, people had a lot of relationships. Those relationships counted, and we worked on a lot of relationships after September, and those mattered, in getting people in to come in and work hard quickly. The engineering, we could talk hours about the engineering. It was the big and the small. There's always a debate about how strong you make assets. Do you just carry on making assets strong, or do you have backup assets? And that's something for IT systems. You know, to have your IT systems is about really planning on the really remote chance because you just don't know what's going to happen. And we had plans that actually allowed for just not knowing what was going to happen. Um, we had somewhere to work from. Um, we, initially, we very, very quickly had a premises which was strong enough that everybody could work from. Not just the guys in the control room, not just the engineers, but the people who pay the bills as well. You know, if you're going to have a recovery, it's going to go on for weeks, and you actually need somewhere for people to go and just go and pay bills from. But it was a place where all the organisation could be together. It's funny, when I go and talk to various local bodies around the country about this, they don't hear what I'm saying. They say, well, yes, we've got a wonderful control, and we can run a great event out of it. I said, look, you're not hearing what I'm saying. You actually need much more than that. You need to think much more about the wider resilience of your organisation. Having everybody, all the players being able to come to work really, really counted. Standardisation, I could talk a lot about standardisation, that helped us. Um, I won't talk about that. Scale. Scale, generally bigger is better. Um, if we'd been a bigger organisation, we would have managed it even better as well. It would have been easier to integrate people from around the country. New Zealand is full of small businesses that actually, I think, manage these sort of events badly because they're just so small. They don't have standardised systems. It's hard for them to bring in other people. Um, a lot of other places are going to get in real trouble if they have an event like this. And we would have done it better if we'd been bigger. Um, communication. Um, we worked hard at our communication. Um, I was very open. I, well, I think I was open. I fronted up at the media very, very early on. We set targets. We set gutsy targets. We didn't always meet those targets, but I think having targets, even if we didn't meet them, mattered. And then when you didn't meet them, you just fronted up and said, we haven't met the target for this reason and that reason. I think it's really easy to go out and set soft targets you meet, but I think a lot of people are much more sophisticated than that, and they know you've set a soft target. I turned up at public meetings with just big, um, um, huge big bits of paper made out of um, butcher's paper with diagrams of what was wrong with the power system. You can go off and spend hours and hours with these bloody graphic designers giving you blue, beautiful graphics, but people just want some fundamental information. And we, just, we ended up making about 10 of these bloody big um, butcher's paper sly things, paper supplied by the Christchurch Press, and they worked really, really well. Improvisation really came, came to the fore. The spin doctors in general had you bloody just putting out beautiful graphics, bullshit bloody, um, you know, bullshit time frames, you know, you've got to be careful how you use your spin doctors in these, in these sorts of times. We, we didn't make that much use of them. Um, governance. So just, just, I want to wind things up, but just thinking about going forward in terms of Christchurch, some of those key lessons, the governance one. Well, right now we have a very strong minister who really, want make, who really wants to make things happen. I'm really happy with the governance. Um, he's not only just a minister of earthquakes, he's minister of